Hello and welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, the electronics reporter. Now, SPICE has been a staple tool for simulating analog circuits for decades. In fact, most engineers will probably have used it during their studies. Today, there is a wealth of simulation tools available, many of which are either open source or free to use. Not only are they used to simulate circuits before committing them to a printed circuit board, but semiconductor manufacturers use them to simulate new chip designs too. Now, there's one question that's been in my mind for a while is, can these tools support the latest wide band gap devices like SIC and GAN? Or do we need new simulation tools that are upgraded for these new technologies and devices? To find out, my experts for this episode are Mike Engelhart and Pete Lucy from Corvo. And I'm just going to bring in Mike. Welcome to the show, Mike. Great to see you. I'm glad to see you've got your, um, uh, as we say in German, Flieger, your bow tie on. Um, you're well known in the uh, semiconductor industry. So what have you been doing at Corvo? Well, I, um, uh, I wrote an all new SPICE uh, program. It's, um, you know, it, briefly put, it's what I would have written 25 years ago when I wrote LT Spice. had I known then what I know now and had today's computer hardware been available back then. Um, it, um, it's a completely re-architected, um, um, redone source. It's, uh, um, uh, has nothing in common with anything I've done before. It, um, um uh, has all new time step control i've uh, removed a lot of the discontinuities that were left in uh, in berkeley spice because right. you know there's a lot of bugs in berkeley spice and these discontinuities don't show up in applications but they they make solving a circuit difficult because you can't analytically iterate to the correct solution um and uh it allows you to present massive amounts of digital logic to your spice simulations you know it will um compile includes optimizing compilers for Verilog and C++ or assembly. If you want to write an assembly, that's okay too. You can interject assembly language into your SPICE program, but it, um, it allows you to present essentially unlimited amount of digital logic reduced to optimized Intel native object code and that's executed during the simulation presented to your analog circuit. So I think that, um, um, you know, I think that uh, th this new this new project, this new uh, simulator is called QSpice, and um, I think that it I think that it does two things. One is I think it makes Spice relevant again. I mean, Spice is uh, it's been called Spice for fifty years, though the project itself is a little older. Yeah, and so it makes Spice relevant again, and it um, you know it introduces. Uh, 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 the ability to interject source code into a spice program for you know the average person you know i think that's uh that's the one thing it does it you can literally draw a box type in some c code or verilog compile and run the thing and see what it does in your circuit and that's um um uh people that have never done that before are now doing that in qspice i think that's what's going to change um the way people design circuits and use simulation and all of it, all of it's free. It's all from Corvo, and um, it's all um, aggressively supported. We, uh, uh, you know, there's there's bills every day. Fantastic. Basically, well, I work on it whenever I'm awake, except for, <laughs> except for covering you, Mr. Stewart. You know, but other than that, you know. fantastic. Well, we'll leave it there for a minute, Mike. I know I'm going to come back to you with uh, some more questions as we can go into it in more depth because I also wanted to uh, introduce your colleague Pete as well to uh, the show. So we'll come back to you in a second. So hi there, Pete. Nice to have you on the show as well. Um, you also work for Corvo. Can you tell us a little bit about the types of products and applications that you cover? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Pete Losey. I'm at Corvo. I'm the uh, Senior Engineering Manager of Power Devices. So um, we're, we're working on bringing uh, you know, ever improving silicon carbide uh, devices to the market. Uh, silicon carbide has enjoyed you know, recent years of, of, of very robust growth. And uh, we bring uh, somewhat of a different flavor, but uh, it allows us to, to bring the highest performance FETs uh, to the market. So we're developing uh, silicon carbide uh, 
FETs, diodes, and, uh, and also JFETs um, at Corvo. Fantastic. Super. Well, I look forward to uh, getting into that in a bit more detail and also finding out how that uh, all integrates into QSPICE as well. Uh, so hang in there and we'll come back to you later in the show. So with that, we've um, also got a sponsor for the show today, which is TME. Products for makers and hobbyists are a solid and growing segment of the TME product portfolio. The most popular are Arduino boards, ranging from the iconic Uno Rev3 through to the MKR and Nano series, right up to the Portenta boards focused on the needs of professional developers. Arduino's latest addition to the lineup, the Uno Rev4 Minima and Uno Rev4 Wi-Fi, can also be ordered directly from the website at tme.eu. Now, I'm a sort of casual user of um, simulation software, and I continue to be amazed by the measurements and insights that can be drawn from the projects, the demo projects that are included in these tools. But uh, like me, you've probably got as many questions for my guests as I have. So regardless of where you're watching, join in the conversation by posting your questions and comments during the show. Simply use the chat function on YouTube and LinkedIn, or you can tweet us on Twitter if it still exists using the hashtag ElectorEI, that's ElectorEI, and we'll do our best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. So, Mike, let's bring you back in. Good, good. It's fantastic to have you on the show. I remember um, you being over here in Europe um, to talk about L LT Spice um, when you worked for Linear Technology. It was a, a fantastic presentation, and it was great to see that immense depth of, of information. And that's really one of the driving forces of, of this show is to sort of broaden the reach of uh, these experts that we have in our field, in our industry, and um, and also record it, which we're also doing for posterity so that people can go back and experience again. Now, as, as you introduced already, SPICE has been around for 50 years, but not necessarily all of us uh, understand its origins. Um, so uh, just maybe quickly uh, run over the um, sort of the history and the background of who developed it, and what were the reasons for SPICE? Why did we need it back uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago? Well, SPICE was originally a class project at um, UC Berkeley. Uh, that's where I went to grad school. And um, it wasn't originally called SPICE. It was called CANCER. For, and that CANCER stood for Computer Analysis of Nonlinear Circuits Excluding Radiation. Uh, maybe a more accurate name than, uh, than SPICE, is what, than the acronym made for SPICE, but it was called CANCER. And um, the reason for this rather contrived acronym is that, um, you know, it was, it was done in the academic year of 69 and 70, uh, 68 and, and 69, uh, shortly after the Summer of Love, basically at the height of the Vietnam War protests. And they called it CANCER to make it very clear it had nothing to do with the military. It made sense at the time to them, okay? <laughs> so they were off writing cancer, and uh, cancer uh, showed a, uh, it was effective. It would simulate nonlinear circuits, which is, um, you'd think it'd be impossible because, you know, you, you go to university and you learn how to do linear algebra, and then if you have a nonlinear system, the professor basically looks at you and says, we're going to wish you a lot of luck with that nonlinear system because there's no general solution. but you know, cancer was able to solve arbitrary nonlinear circuits. And it just deals with the fact that um, an electronic circuit is a very specific and very narrow example of a nonlinear circuit in that it has continuous, it's, uh, all the IV curves are continuous in value and slope. And so you can analytically iterate to the solution. And uh, if that doesn't work, you can take a smaller time step so that the previous time step is a better, ever better guess for the current time step and that is always true because every single nonlinear nonlinearity in electronics is bypassed with some capacitance. So eventually, the previous time step is a very good solution for the uh, for the current one. Uh, now, that's how cancer started. Uh, Larry Nagel was a um, uh, was a central figure in coding it up, though it was a class project, and. Um, for when Larry Nagel did his started his master's thesis. Um, his first job, his first task was to give it a nicer name. 
because the dean of UC Berkeley was not going to have a program called cancer on this campus. That's just wasn't going to fly. So you had to think of a nice name. And if you think of, a, you know, if you consider the concept of taste in the United States in the 1970s, what could be nicer than Spice? <laughs> so Spice was another in-your-face name. And Spice is going to answer the second part of your question about why you'd want it. So Spice is simulation program with integrated circuit emphasis. So that's actually important. You, uh, we're talking to people who do, uh, you know, your, your opening focus was board level design, but Spice was all about designing ICs because the time between designing a schematic, laying it out and fabbing it was some fraction of a year. Yeah. So you needed to uh, have a good idea whether or not it was going to work before you went through that process. You didn't, you, you wouldn't have, you'd only have a few iterations before you'd completely missed any viable time to market. And that was the exactly. point of circuit simulation. It was all for, it was all about ICs. And it was all, and, and Spice did a very good job of simulating anything that you could lithograph on a piece of silicon, but it didn't do so good on, you know, on general components. You know, there's no native spark gap component yeah. in Spice. There's no native, um, um, well, the, the ferromagnetism has been added, um, but it was not, it was never part of Berkeley Spice, that's for certain. Um, IGPTs, can't print an IGPT on a transistor. There's no native circuit element in uh, Berkeley Spice for an IGPT, and, and the list just goes on. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's why it was written for designing ICs. So of course, over the, over the years, um, we we know you from from linear technologies, LT Spice um, in the past, and and I think that's a tool that many people have downloaded and used over the years. Um, you could almost say it's it's sort of a, a standard tool that people draw upon to do um, analog circuit simulation. Um, but, you know, all, all of a sudden I got the email um, to say that uh, there's a new SPICE tool on the market from Corvo and, uh, and you were behind it. So tell us a little bit about, um, you know, the, the state of SPICE um, in general and, and sort of the, what, what LT SPICE managed to achieve and, and the gaps that you saw and said, hey, you know, the, these are the things I want to fix in order to make um, QSpice uh, a tool for, for the next decade. So LTSpice um, is an interesting story that isn't really understood by very many people. Uh, I had been writing simulators for decades, but not circuit simulators, not very many circuit simulators, you know, charge particle optics, um, various um, um, uh, simulators for oil exploration, basically highly secret simulators, simulators that were only used by, you know, maybe a dozen people. And I was interested in writing something that was uh, m uh, more visible, more uh, had more utility than just what a dozen people thought of it. Um, so I joined Linear Tech and they wanted one thing, but I wanted to... Um, uh, I wanted to give away a, um, a free schematic capture to SPICE program basically because I was caught up with the psychology of the success of Linux being so popular. That was my agenda, is I wanted to uh, uh, make it possible for anyone to draw a schematic, push go, and see a simulation. That's what I, I wanted to uh, inflict on the world. And... Um, I was able to go from zero to a, um, a first release in a little less than a year. There were things I did to do that, and um, I'm not entirely happy with the way I architected things. And it did, it did become very popular. It, it, it is uh, LT Splice to this date is still overwhelmingly the most widely used and distributed circuit simulator in industry whatsoever. Uh, last time I had, uh, I used to have um, um, private metrics to all the different simulators because I I'd talk to people at different companies. You know, in those days when you interviewed someplace, you didn't have to sign an NDA. You just walk in, they tell you everything, you got the information, you you know, and you could leave. Yeah. So I had that information, and and the the metrics measure came out to being that LT Spice was used one thousand times more than all other Spice programs combined. And I think it's still very close to that. You know, I think it's, I, I, you know, the, those metrics would be, you know, uh, five years old, but, you know, it, it, it can't be, it can't have drifted that much off because there haven't been any other new SPICE programs since QSPICE. Uh, now, 
with QSpice, I just um, um, I started over with the original code. I refactored everything, and in doing that, I don't think anybody has started with the Berkeley Spice source code and been familiar with it. I mean, deeply familiar with it, and then gone to a, a release Spice code. And if you do that, you see bugs you would never find. I mean, there was four bugs in the sparse matrix package that I found that um, uh, uh, that I don't think you can ever find unless you come through that path, that arduous journey that takes you know a decade to get through. And um, there's just a lot of other things. In the, uh, 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 there are a lot of problems that I found in the code that you would never find unless you're very familiar with it in the first place and starting anew with the original code, starting entirely with a fresh lobotomy. So, the result was um, I had a, uh, a better SPICE program, just on SPICE fundamentals. You give it a, a net list of a bunch of transistors, QSPICE will solve it, and um, other SPICE SPICE programs probably cannot solve it. it um, there was a, a benchmark suite of circuits, and for the and QSPICE is the, that weren't developed by me. I just happened to have had these benchmarks. They were developed in 1990. Um, and uh, QSpice is the first simulator I've seen of any spice at any price that will run every single circuit. So that was my original goal. My, my, my quest, my mission was that I wanted to get spice right. You know, it's a big complicated code unless you've yeah. talked to people from the Berkeley CAD group and had them explain to you why it's written the way it is and, you know, what it was trying to do. Unless you have had that information and then gotten familiar with the code and then started new with it, you won't get to that point. I think I got to that point. Then um, it had, I interacted with uh, a number of IC manufacturers during its uh, three and a half year development. And um, uh, uh, to great benefit to QSpice, I then added the ability to handle, you know, present massive amounts of digital logic to the SPICE simulation. Um, and also it has, um, uh, well, it had, it started off with a very good set of, uh, gates and flops because the original, um, uh, task of QSpice was for designing ASICs. So there's gates and flops as native circuit elements that, you know, handle, you know, commutation, you know, the nature of commutation of the output and, uh, rise time and delay and, and impedances and, and, and all this, all that stuff is in there. So you can do good gates and flops. But there's so much. There's only so much you can do with, you know, with instancing out gates and flops. There's only so much logic you can present. You know, it's good for like MSI, but you know, that's about that might be the end of the road. If you want to have something really interactive in your simulation, uh, to go beyond that, you needed to handle um, uh, uh, you needed to handle source code, either um, HDL or I actually prefer to just write in C I think that Verilog will help you um, find edges and events. And it has a contraption for setting all that up for you. But if you really understand circuit simulation, which I think you need to, to, to advance, you know, if you want to be at the leading edge, you got to know what's known. And uh, so you want to just write in C++. And I've have in QSpice, I've put uh, a couple of examples where you can see exactly how to do what you're trying to do, detect edges and events and, you know, uh, uh, store the internal data structures. So you could write a C++, uh, uh, a com a com write a component in C++ that runs just blindingly fast. Yeah. And that, that was the, the path of its development. That's, that's, it's fascinating to understand also that, that background there of, of, uh, of how it came about and, and the sort of the analysis again of, of the original um Barclay tool that was created so uh, I think one of the um as I said at the beginning one of the, the the big changes that's going on at the minute and we're really seeing I think you were also maybe at PCIM um or uh, back at the beginning of the year we're seeing in the, the in the area of power conversion that silicon carbide and, and gallium nitride as wide band gap um semiconductors are, are making huge inroads uh, it's sort of changing completely how um power power applications are being developed is is there a problem with the existing spice tools in in simulating wide band gap um devices and if so has q spice got something extra which helps people to um simulate wide band gap devices yeah uh existing spice programs don't have device equations to support any wide band gap devices 
you know, the band gap isn't the problem, it's the topology of the circuit. Like in GAN, right. there's no substrate diode. There's, of course, no body diode because it's a lateral uh, device, but there's no substrate diode. And if you go to Berkeley Spice and try to turn off the substrate diode due to um, Berkeley Spice's um, um, uh, Newton, or, uh, Newton damping, the, uh, you run into all these not a number situations and you can't solve the circuit. So the first thing you have to do is make is you can turn off the substrate diode, uh, which most last time I checked commercial spice programs, they couldn't do it. Berkeley Spice doesn't do it. It's trivial change. It's an easy thing to do, but uh, you do have to turn off the substrate diode for, for GAN. The other problem it doesn't handle is that uh, GAN has a lot of gate leakage and it's a nonlinear gate leakage. And you need to model the, the nonlinearity to some extent because there are a lot of uh, uh, power controllers that use the gate drive as a dual purpose. You put a resistor from the gate to the source. When you turn the thing on, it reads out that resistor and programs something inside the part. And then, you know, the resistor is just some high value resistor. It doesn't affect anything after that, except, you know, helping sure that the Fed is off when you uh, turn the thing on. And uh, if you try to model the gate leakage of the linear loss, you'll muck up that programming. So you have to model the, the gate nonlinearity. And then there's, there's, um, there's another problem, and that is, it really stems from the fact that um, the device equations in Berkeley Spice are mostly based on Sigmund Hodge, which they were from Bell Labs, and they, you know, where the transistor was invented, and they made these, um, uh, they wrote device equations for a channel, what, be it that, be it, be it a JFET or a MOSFET, uh, for your square law device. And there's just a, there's an error in the derivation of it that uh, means that you can't match both the saturation region where the current doesn't depend on the, the, the drain gate source voltage. You have basically a current source and the linear region where it acts more like a resistor. You can match one or the other, but there's an error there and the error is like a factor of two. Right. You know, the, 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 I first noticed this, that I would match the saturation region, look at the RDS on and the RDS on in simulation was twice as much as the real part. And that's what you expect. You expect the simulation to be optimistic, not pessimistic. And it's yeah. just a bug in the derivation of the Sinchman Hodge equations. So the first thing you need is a, um, you need to independently match the RDS on uh, with the saturation region. So that, that's a, a, a fundamental change to the device equations that not very many space programs do. And you need it for both JFETs and uh, MOSFETs. You need it for both channel, both channel types. Then um, uh, another problem is you really do want to model uh, subthreshold conduction. And uh, Berkeley Spice doesn't handle that very well until you get the BSIM-3. But um, Philips had a whole bunch of device equations. They, they, they published a whole bunch of open source um, uh, 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 devices. Philips was kind of an interesting story. They, they developed device equations. They were, they were a leader in electronics. They had, you know, they had people that would develop device equations for devices. And then they had this and they'd go to Cadence and they said, look, we'd like to sell these to you because these are valuable. These are how the parts actually work and you would have a better simulator. And Cadence looked at them and says, no, you don't understand how it works. You pay us, and then we take the code, we put it in our software. And Philip says, we'll just get to give the equations away to anybody that wants them, which is, I use those too at times. So right. um, uh, you need to get subthreshold conduction for both JFETs and uh, MOSFETs. Uh, there's a, uh, some other... Uh, uh, IV curve variations you have to deal with. You have to deal, there's some work to do on the charge models. Um, and uh, you just need to give a lot of flexibility there. You know, like in a, in a vertical MOSFET, you have a very highly nonlinear uh, gate drain capacitance because the gate and drain oppose each other. And the, there's something which in IC design parlance would be called an overlap capacitance. The capacitance has nothing to do with the channel. And, um, uh, that overlap capacitance is highly nonlinear because the channel conducts or not, and that changes the capacitance between the gate and the drain, which are opposed to each other, whether that channel conducts or not. So you have a highly nonlinear uh, overlap capacitance, and that affects, you know, uh, actually, you know what? That That is only for silicon. That's not a, a an element in GAN or silicon carbide. I forgot about that. It's, it's a fun detail, but it's not what you're asking. <laughs> yeah. 
Good. So, um, yeah, I was going to say that now's probably a, a good point to uh, in the show to actually then have a quick look at QSpice. Have you uh, got it available um, to share with us at all? Sure. Let's um, let's do a share screen. Share screen. Uh, entire screen. Let's take this one. Share. And. Had to push the button twice, like George Justin had a hard day at work. Had to push the button three times today, you know. Um, okay, so let's um, let's go into first um, uh, uh, subthreshold conduction. So here we have a JFET, and I'm going to keep a constant gate. Uh, drain source voltage, and I'm gonna uh, uh, sweep the gate voltage, and let's and so here's your your square law behavior, but let's plot it on a log scale. So let's go over to the right, plot that logarithmic, and here you can see the problem. Now this this line here is the Berkeley spice equations, and the problem is the thing just shuts off once you're below threshold, the zero conduction. But you know the part that's rather non-physical behavior. So even though this is a case where the IV curve is continuous in value and slope. The slope goes to zero, which never happens in a, in a, in a physical part, where if you adjust this parameter eta, and I use the name eta because uh, when Berkeley Spice tried to get, do um, subthreshold conduction in, in, in uh, Berkeley Spice in uh, level three MOSFET, they tried to get it and they called it eta. So I just call it eta to be this parameter that uh, adjusts the uh, subthreshold conduction. It switches over from square law to exponential. So the um, uh, uh, the threshold, the conduction never goes to zero. <clears throat> All right, let's look at um, um, on x. So here we have another JFET and R on x is the multiplier for, um, um, uh, uh, in, in the linear region. And I'm just going to step R on X. So here you can see the saturation region, but the this slope here is the on resistance. I can independently affect uh, a change the on resistance without changing the saturation. So that allows me to independently match both the saturation and linear region with fairly simple, with rather very simple device equations, computational light uh, device equations. I can model a JFET now. Uh, there's one other thing I should show you. I forgot to mention. Uh, uh, we have these Casco devices, which allows Corvo to supply silicon carbide FETs of otherwise unreachable RDS on. And it entails a, a MOSFET and a JFET in, um, um, in uh, 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 it contains a MOSFET and a JFET is two different dice in one package. And the, um, the JFET handles the um, the voltage and the and the MOSFET uh, makes it enhancement mode, so that if you gate if you ground the gate and the source, the thing is off, which you'd you'd want in most power applications. But all of this device here, actually, there's another inductor inductance in here that's supported. These both dice, these inductors are encapsulated in one native circuit element. So there's a new there's a new level MOSFET in QSpice. It's called a a level 2010 because that's when the these Casco devices were introduced. So it uh, includes all of all the device equations, both FETs and these inductors in one native circuit element with a reduced node count. So it um, it runs more robustly and you have this simple thing that you, you put a, a component on the schematic and the simulation just behaves like that component. You don't have to uh, cobble a bunch of different uh, lower uh, primitives together to get it. So that's another thing it does for the silicon carbide. But you know what, let's let's actually do a, an LT, a, a Q spice demo, okay? Uh, the main difference between QSpice and um, other simulators is that it has a completely, it has a more modern GUI than you will normally find in a Spice program. Okay, and it has more modern GUI than you find in CAD tools. So basically, you don't have a lot of toolbar buttons. Everything is right-click menu, so you don't have to move the mouse all the way to the toolbar and move it all the way back. It's sad how much people like to use toolbars, kind of a 1990s technology. And people get good at using tool things with toolbars, and then they, they feel they're great at using the app, and they spend all the time swatting at the computer with their mouse to get the thing to do the simplest thing. Yes. So um, let's, um, let's just do a, a simple, sorry, let's, let's do a, a you know, hello world type simulation. 
So I have hotkeys for all the different components. And um, now, instead of having dialogues, everything is edited in place. The problem with having a dialogue is that you have to shift your eyes from what you're trying to edit to the dialogue, type in what you want to do, and then go back to the component. And that actually gets fatiguing. Yeah, um, exactly. uh, UI is more about ergonomics than anything else. You'll notice that as I type, I have a hint underneath that tells me all, what all these numbers do. And you can see there's a little software cursor here. The, this one micro I'm typing in, the software cursor is pointing at what I'm typing in. Yeah. And that's really helpful as well, because I think one of the, the, the biggest challenges of using Spice at all is understanding all of those um, options that you can put into parameters like Pulse for, for developing yeah. your, your circuit. So. Yeah, it, it Spice suffers from its legacy. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, and so all the editors are in place. Like this editor is my mouse cursor. I can type in, you know, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a full, uh, um, uh, a little editor that's my mouse cursor. And now we just turn it on. Here's a little green on button, run simulation. So that's a, a little hello world, um, uh, Simulation. Now I'll show you the, nice. the a feature that I just started adding. Um, all right. So in uh, usually one simulation is not that interesting. You want, usually want to look at multiple simulations with a step command. Yeah. So I'm going to step the resistor and I'm going to step the capacitor. And let's run the simulation now. You can see all these things, but the problem is it's hard to know what waveform dealt with uh, what, um, uh, what, what sets of values. So I just, I just recently added this navigator, press F6 and there will be the step simulation tool. You can double click on one or the other. You can sort them by different criteria. You can select you know, which ones you want, apply selections, or you can plot all. And if you have a uh, attached cursor to this thing, then as you, uh, this cursor is, is these dashed lines point at which cursor it's at, or you can move the cursor with the navigation tool. That's really nice. I, I yeah. think, that, again, the, you're highlighting one of the, the big challenges with spice tools in general. I mean, they're, they're great for, for implementing a simulation, but when it comes to usability and understanding and analyzing the results, it's, um, it has been very clunky in the past. So it's, uh, yeah, features like this that really make it highly usable. Yeah, now there is one example, when you, for, for people who haven't used QSpice, I always recommend the very first thing you do, you should just run some simulations, you know, get that done. There's some examples here. So under File, Open Demo, there's a number of examples you can uh, look at. Um, and uh, the one that is, um, this is not on topic for wide band gap, but this is the one that will uh, show the um, uh, what QSpice is about as far as this mixed mode simulation thing. So this example would be a, a modern switchboard power supply. I mean, this is not a clocked flop. This is a constant on time, but it uses a, a very clever constant on time algorithm. So it's also constant frequency, but it, you know, it has no error amplifier. There's basically no, um, there's no good frequency domain description of this thing. It's simply, you know, the crossover frequency is the Nyquist frequency, which means it is oscillating. It's oscillating at the switching frequency. They're, they're both the same feedback loop. And you can see how it's implemented. So this block here is hierarchical. You can enter schematic. And that's what's inside this thing. So inside this thing is, is this thing here. I call this Acme Semiconductor. It's a catalog part from that coyote that I used to, uh, from the supplier for that coyote I used to enjoy watching Saturday mornings. And um, so here you see have the usual gates and flops. These all you know work like, you know these are all ASIC modeling quality gates and flops. But this little bad boy here, that's C code. So right click, C++ interface, open C source. That's the source code to that device. And this shows, this is 
written to illustrate the main techniques you you want to do. You know, it has the uh, the commutation times, minimum on and off times. It has this defect, deceptively simple algorithm to be both constant on time and constant frequency. And, you know, it simulates uh, three milliseconds of a five kilohertz switcher in a uh, little over a second. That's brilliant. And that, that C++ interface is, um, when you say it's C++, is it written in C++ or is it very long embedded into a sort of C++ um, you, you know, sort of wrapper? You know what, let's just, it, it's literally C++ and let's, let's take it from the top. Uh, there is, uh, let's uh, do a, um, a new schematic and I will show you how easy it is. So I first have to save the schematic someplace because of the C++ is in a different file. I'll just save it um, um, uh, and um, draw hierarchical entry. And I am going to make this not a hierarchical entry, but a, a DLL. So show symbol property, symbol type here at the bottom is a little Norsk O, which looks sort of like the zero on a computer terminal. So that's the, the, the spice prefix I use if it's going to be a DLL. Now I'm going to add some ports. I'll change the justification. So the port type is an input. The data type, it has supports all these different uh, data types. These you know, are partly Verilog, partly C++. I usually just use floating point. Okay, control C, control V, oh. control C, control V, control E mirrors. This will be the out um, port type output. I'll add a test vector before I write the C code. Now we're going to do the C code. And this is the part I wanted to do to answer your question. So C++ interface, open C++ source. It says, what are you talking about? You don't have any source code. Should I make you? And uh, here you set for some options for other function types you can declare, but let's skip all that. So this, it just wrote the C++ program. And there's this thing, implement the module evaluation code here. And I'm going to say that out is equal to n times n. OK? Yeah. So this is just C++. There's no Verilog at all. Right click, compile it. Down here, it says it was created. So add a simulation command, dot tran 3m on simulation. There's the input, and there's the output. And that's nice. how easy it is to write in C++. That's, yeah. that's very impressive. All right. Very impressive indeed. Oh, <laughs> now let's do Verilog. OK, Control-C, Control-V here. Now the module name here of uh, TV underscore X1, I have to give it a different name because it's going to be a different DLL. And I'm going to say right click Verilog interface. Open Verilog source. What are you talking about? There's no Verilog source. Do you want me to create a template? Yes, please. And here is the ins and outs. So basically, it's the module with the port names being the um, uh, arguments to the module. Implement the module here. And I'll just say um, sign out equals in times in times in. Right click compile. Now there's two things that it, oh, 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 I have a typo. So actually let's do that this again. And we double click on this and it's, it, it puts the cursor to the line with the error. So there's right. a bit of an IDE here for the whole developing your source code. And let's try again, compile. You look at the bottom, it says the ver it, it, it create it, it converted the Verilog to C++ and then it made an interface for the C++ to the, um, uh, to the simulator. So actually, C++ is the is the is what's connected to the simulator, but it will convert Verilog to C++. Okay, that's what's happening. Now let's run this simulation again, and there's the input, the output, and there is the output cubed. Fantastic. So uh, it's very impressive, and um, yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, everybody's minds start to um, to whir as they think of um, yeah things that they could could do with this and implement with it that uh, haven't been possible in the past with previous tools. So 
very impressive. Super. We're going to have to leave it there, Mike, um, I'm afraid. So uh, we need to uh, also have a chat with Pete um, as well. So stay uh, on the line for us and we'll come back to you in a moment or two and uh, have, a, have a chat and answer some, uh, some questions from our audience. Thanks very much. No. So now it is um, competition time. So I need to actually go and find uh, our competition giveaway for today. Uh, there we go. So uh, previously we gave away two starter kits that included 37 science projects for Arduino. So congratulations go to Glenn and Michael, your kits should already have arrived. And to extend our thanks to you as loyal Engineering Insights viewers, for this episode I have five USB sticks packed with over 3,500 of the best circuits a lector has ever published. And I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun uh, trying to simulate those in QSpice 2. The designs cover everything from audio and video and home and garden to power supplies and batteries. If you're not able to build them, you can simulate them today after the show. For your chance to win, simply visit the link shown below and enter the keyword SPICE, that's the keyword SPICE, with your entry, and good luck with that. Smashing, so let's um, bring in Pete, just click in the right place. Hi Pete, lovely to have you on the show. Uh, thanks for hanging on in there, as you can uh, tell, with us, uh, Mike is always uh, plenty to share and explain, and it's always uh, exciting, so I appreciate your patience. Um, now, when we uh, introduced you at the beginning of the show, you were explaining that you focus on, on power applications. Uh, what I wanted to do was um, look a bit more at this wide band gap technology, silicon carbide known as SIC. Um, for those who've not yet really encountered uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs, can you give a sort of a brief um, explanation of the difference between a silicon MOSFET and a SIC MOSFET? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the main difference is that silicon carbide has a wider band gap and a higher critical electric field, right? And so what that boils down to is that you can typically block the same voltage with a 10x thinner layer uh, doped 10 times higher, right? And so, you know, the parasitic resistance of any blocking layer decreases with higher doping and obviously decreases with thinner active layers, right? And so the way you can kind of take away all that is we can get higher voltage devices in silicon carbide that still have very low resistance when conducting, right? And so in, in the end, silicon carbide offers voltages, uh, higher voltages with low resistance and a smaller die size for a given voltage uh, with Im improved conduction and switching performance over, over a standard silicon device. Yeah. Now silicon has to go, you know, is challenged to go up be, uh, above a couple of hundred volts uh, where they have to introduce a technology called superjunction or, or charge balancing to get in the 650 to 900 volt range. And then above that into 1200 volt range, they have to introduce things called IGBTs, which is a bipolar transistor, right? And so that comes at the cost of, of getting those injected carriers out when you try to turn the device off, right? And so this has uh, a dramatic impact on switching loss. So silicon carbide devices can uh, achieve those voltage ratings with a single carrier device, which has very so low switching loss and uh, superior conduction loss. Now, when we look at the naming of these devices, we, you know, if you're looking through somebody's website, it will say SICK MOSFET. Um, that gives you the feeling that um, this is just a, a silicon carbide version of a, of a silicon MOSFET. So it's it's basically maybe just internally the material that's that's changed. Um, but when I look at um, and read information about silicon MOSFETs, what we're what we're always being told is that you know these are the devices for switching power converters. And um, I don't think anyone would sort of sit down and assume that we would use it in a as a simple um, on-off power switch. Is is there any technical reason um, why a like a, a, a silicon MOSFET couldn't be replaced by a SICK device in in any in any design, or is it just a case of you know sick devices are a little bit more expensive still at the minute, um, and and therefore it, it doesn't make financial sense? No, I think if you look at um, uh, it's kind of where where the biggest biggest advantage came early, uh, you know, and again you have to take this with a grain of salt. The shine, the places where silicon carbide shine is six fifty volts and above, right? 
And so, yes, like you said, the low on resistance, the low output capacitance makes them very attractive for switch mode power supplies and converters, right? But they do have a lot of great features that make them attractive for a simple solid state switch or a protection device. They got really low conduction loss and they scale very well to higher voltages. Silicon carbide FETs are incredibly robust and have good avalanche capability and good surge current ride through energy capability. So they have good turnoff RBSOA uh, and silicon carbide itself has a three times better thermal conductivity than silicon, right? And so when you put all of this together, you can see that there's a lot of functional be benefits of moving uh, uh, to um, solid state protection devices to silicon carbide. Uh, this market will sort of take time to mature and grow, um, but we see a bright future for silicon carbide in these applications. Now, when I've looked at silicon carbide in the past and, and also written about it, um, it, to me, it always looks like uh, a silicon carbide MOSFET is, is broadly built in the same structure as a silicon MOSFET. But my understanding, and I, I had an article that I read from you, um, we had written about this, that the, the Corvo approach is a casco design. So why, why is Corvo, is, is Corvo the only people using this cascode approach? Why are you doing it that way? And, and how do the en engineers benefit from it who uh, want to use your, your SICK devices in their application? Yeah, so, so yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's a great question, Stuart. And we put a lot of sort of publication and, and, and educated customers over, over the years on, on, on what all this is and why and what advantage it brings to the customer. And if you boil that all down, the short answer to me is to get the lowest on resistance per given die area. Uh, that's why we use the cascode. So the one area where silicon carbide really does not shine over silicon is what's called the inversion carrier mobility in the MOSFET, right? And so the inversion carrier sort of transport and mobility along the interface of the silicon carbide and oxide in a MOSFET remains order of magnitude or more uh, lower than, than silicon MOSFETs. So conventional silicon carbide MOSFETs have a parasitic channel resistance that dominates their performance, right? And this can be anywhere from 40 to 65% of the total on resistance of the total switch, you know, for modern silicon carbide MOSFETs. So in our design, we use a low on resistance, low voltage mo silicon MOSFET as simply as the control switch. And this is below a very low on resistance, high voltage normally on silicon carbide JFET. And so in a sense, what you can think of is we use silicon for what it's great at, which is excellent gate characteristics and high transconductance. And we use silicon carbide for what it's great at, blocking high voltages with very low on resistance, right? And so the net result is a normally off uh, FET with the lowest specific on resistance of any technology at 650 volts and above. And this includes silicon, silicon superjunction, GAN, or silicon carbide MOSFET. And so what this does for people is the smaller die size uh, or the, you know, the smaller die for a given on resistance of the cascode gives a lower output capacitance, which is great for low switching losses. And it easy allow, easily allows efficient high frequency soft switching, right? Yeah. The cascode also yields like a superior integral diode in the cascode FET. And so when you look at conduction in the third quadrant, what you'll see is that you only go through the little 0.7 volt silicon knee followed by the very low on resistance of the JFET in the third quadrant. And so the net result is the integral diode has a low QRR, it's a unipolar diode, uh, essentially in the silicon carbide, or yeah, in the silicon carbide. But the, the forward drop is very similar to that of a Schottky diode. So one, one and a half volt knee volt, or forward drop um, on top of the 0.7 volt silicon knee, whereas the conventional MOSFET would give you three volts or more. And so this allows uh, a lower dead time losses with the cascode as well. So not just the, 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 the first quadrant conduction, but the third quadrant conduction as well. Now, one of the, you've, you've highlighted sort of the key ad advantages that, that SICK offers. Um, we've got the, the higher operating temperatures are possible, lower RDS on, faster switching speeds. Um, for engineers who are sort of tackling their first SICK based um, switching converter design, what are the, the key sort of challenges and gotchas that come up in that process that they, they have to tackle? Well, I, you know, there's a few design challenges that, that, that have to be kept in mind when you move to wideband gap or silicon carbide. You know, first, you have to remember that these components are capable of quick switching quite uh, fast DVDT edge rates and current slew rates. 
So it follows that layout should be kept uh, with minimal parasitics, right? We actually recommend the use of bus numbers close to the, to the power um, bridge. And then we do recommend uh, the use of small device output snubbers where possible. So the small RC device snubbers can easily be implemented with surface mount or board mounting components because the, the actual power dissipation in the snubber is quite low. But this easily allows you to yield well-behaved, well-damped waveforms without having to add additional delay just by tuning with high gate resistance. So that's one area sort of where uh, we're, we're seeing sort of a, a movement in design to, to in wideband gap. The other is obviously the use of Kelvin source connected packages, right? So and carbide and, and, and wideband gap in general uh, can do amazing things and do amazing things quickly. The packages and package development has to keep up with this. So Kelvin source connected packages like a four lead TU247 or a D2 pack seven lead or a toll uh, allow you to get the best performance while maintaining cleanest gateway forms. So you really yeah. want to separate that common source inductance in the package wherever possible. And then finally, um, folks, I think, have to remember that wideband gap devices are allowing designers to achieve new benchmarks in, in power density. Uh, but this sort of added benefit in power density comes at a challenge to thermal management. And yeah. so, um, you know, with silicon carbide, we can see the discrete components that offer on, low on resistance and power levels that are historically only achieved with large power modules, right? Uh, an example of this is, we have recently released a 5.4 milliohm 750 volt in a toll package, right? Which is a sort of surface mount component. So to help with this, you know, we're trying to proliferate our products across many packages, uh, but not only that, but offer a wide range of, of, of different on resistance uh, components within a family. And so this allows the user to be able to, to optimize the cost performance and thermal management uh, um, of, their, of their converter. Yeah. So um, now you've got QSpice as a, as a tool at Corvo available. How in, are you starting to see the sort of the benefits of that in, in uh, simulating sick based applications? And how close do the simulations look to reality uh, once you sort of factored in all the parasitics on the board and, and uh, those other challenges that, that you, you face once you make something? Yeah. So again, like like Mike put it best, uh, QSpice actually created a, a, a native element uh, for our silicon carbide cast code, and you know we ha we we have pretty accurate uh, spice based models, but uh, these are built on adding sort of different elements and behavioral elements in the in in the model, which do great to predict their behavior in simple sort of double pulse or half bridge circuits. But when you sort of try to build a, a, a full converter. Uh, system with the control uh, uh, signals, it becomes cumbersome and 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 sort of loses robustness. So QSpice is helping us to to um, put all of that together. So as Mike had mentioned, there there's a, a 2010 level model that's a good place to start for our device. If you're looking at putting additional complexity beyond sort of a simple half bridge or double pulse simulation, and again with the improved robustness and convergence, it'll run faster, um, and you're still able to achieve very good predictability again in wide band gap as long as sort of you understand the parasitic elements that are that are on your board and package right um yeah. it can be quite predictive and sort of we've sort of started to to sort of proliferate our product portfolio into qspice and you'll see sort of more and more grow over over the next few months with with even more advanced models and and wider portfolio Super. Well, thank you ever so much for that overview of, of the uh, Corvo SICK MOSFETs. Um, it's very helpful to understand as well uh, what's going on in, in terms of the device development and the, the difference in functionality between your devices and, and some of the other devices we see on, on the market. I'm just going to bring Mike back in now so as we can um, answer some of our audience questions. So uh, thank you to everybody who's watching for contributing and, and joining in. Um, here's a Here's a question from a person I've not seen for a long time. Hi, Antonio. Uh, we used to work together 20 years ago, so uh, a lot of time has passed. It's good to see you there. Uh, he asks, hi, all. Do you have a Python wrapper as well? So I guess it's sort of directed at Mike. Um, is there sort of any intention to provide sort of Python support? It's a, obviously a language which is, is gaining in, in interest in for all sorts of applications. 
Well, I, I, my understanding of Python wrappers is that they call Q, they call the simulator in command line mode. And yes, that's, that's documented in the help. I don't, um, use Python cause I just, I just write directly in C plus plus, except when I'm in a bad mood and I write in assembly, but, um, <laughs> uh, Python can call QSpice, uh, from the command line. Uh, and there is. I want to extend support for Python uh, users, and that is I want to make a command line ability to extract the waveform data to a CVS file because uh, QSpice's waveform data uses some advanced database technologies where it replaces data with procedure, meaning um, instead of having... um, uh, you know, the, the current and a resistor is a trace in the data file. It says the current and the resistor is this much mo times the voltage be- the voltage between these two nodes. And so with that one line of an alias, if you if you like more out the top of a waveform file, you'll see these aliases that say how to compute waveform fi- different quantities so that you don't have to um, uh, just, just to re- reduce the size of the waveform data. Anyway, it's, it means you to read the waveform file, you need a compiler. You can't read yeah. the waveforms without a, without a compiler. And uh, I want to make um, a command line utility to extract, uh, like this is almost the next thing I'm gonna be doing is make a, a command line u- a utility for c- extracting waveform data to, uh, yeah. I'll start with CVS because, you probably are just going to extract a few waveforms and the ASCII format should be acceptable for, for speed and, and certainly facilitate debugging and, and that. Super. So there we go. There's a, a, some future plan for, for that. Um, so Pete, one of the questions I had for you, um, we've, I mean, as, as I said, I was at PCIM this year, we saw SICK being increasingly deployed into all manner of, of applications. Where do you see the market at the minute? Are, are there any sort of exciting or particularly prevalent uh, power converter spaces? I don't know, maybe solar or um, EV charging, for example, where you're seeing um, SICK being uh, grabbed as as the uh, as a component of choice. Yeah, I mean, uh, silk and carbide. You know, the big one that gets a lot of press is the EV traction inverter, right? Right. Uh, allowing the 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 800 volt system with a very efficient 1200 volt device just with a two level inverter is um, uh, a big application that's pulling silicon carbide. Onboard charging uh, has, has been another big application. Offboard charging, clearly. Uh, PV uh, has got a lot of pull for silicon carbide, energy storage systems, and we're even starting to see interest in the, the solid state protection space. Okay. For us, our, our you know, our devices have the very lowest uh, RDS on specific uh, with a very low COSS time related. So soft switching circuits, uh, we, we, we offer um, very good efficiency across the power range. So we're seeing adoption in uh, data center power supplies, both in the totem pole uh, PFC front end and then in yep. the primary side of the DC DC stage. Super. So those are the, the places uh, we need to keep an eye on. And uh, if, if that's an application that you're working on, um, then uh, SIC is definitely it's definitely time to, to start looking at the uh, SIC MOSFETs. I'm just looking here at our uh, viewers. Now we've got um, one of our regulars, uh, Theo. Uh, he's based in the Netherlands. He's got a couple of questions from Mike, um, and I'm going to pull up a couple of them. The first one um, he asked, is it possible to simulate with finer time steps? And another question um, that he has asked is, can multiple signals be plotted in separate plots? So maybe, Mike, uh, you want to address both of those in, in one go? Yeah, so in time step control, yes, you can stipulate a maximum time step. Um, that's just uh, the fourth number of the dot .tran command. It's um, um, uh, the dot trans syntax is a little unfortunate in that the first number is ignored because it dealt with ASCII paper plots. But right. changing the um, uh, the Berkeley Spice syntax is also not very palatable. So it's the fourth number of the dot trans command is the maximum time step for multiple um, uh, 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 plots. Let me let me share a screen again and, and show yep. you some uh, uh, stuff. Share screen. Uh, entire screen. Let's do this one. Share. 
and you should have that. Let me um, um, open demo um, and let's look at this one. So this is extracting the loop gate. So here's an audio amplifier and I interject signals to extract the open loop transfer function while it's operating closed loop. Uh, as you simulate this, this is going to be one plot. Um, here I'm looking at the current gain, the voltage gain, and then uh, they convolute together into a net loop gain uh, per uh, R. David Middlebrook's 1975 paper on uh, feedback loops. So uh, if we get rid of, if we uncomment this thing here, so it's going to now do a step. And um, so it's running multiple simulations. So you can see all these uh, simulations. Let me, I'll get this out of the way for a second. So here you have all these different simulations. Let me uh, just make a copy of this. And let's say I just want to look at, well, um, here you'd want to use the step tool. So here we press F6. Let's just look at that one, apply. And over here, we use the step tool of F6. Let's just look at that one, apply. And there you can see the two different uh, simulations plotted in different waveforms. But what's interesting is that um, uh, in this, um, uh, um, I have these dot measure statements, which actually measure the, uh, the phase margin. Uh, these are the statements here. Let me uncomment this for a second. And just look at the uh, behavior of these two phase, uh, of this phase margin. It gives you the phase margin here. It's 73 degrees. And the crossover frequency is um, um, uh, looks like it's uh, 400 kilohertz. All right. So is that right? Let's just um, yeah, 450 kilohertz. It's a real good audio amplifier. Um, exceedingly low um, uh, harmonic distortion. But you know the phase margin is actually like basically it's not a good quantum number. It kind of varies all over the place because in um, in an AB amp like this, as you switch from the high side, the low side to running both, the phase margin varies dramatically. So let's look at the phase margin as we change the output voltage. So I'll uncomment that, and then I'll I'll plot these phase margin numbers. So these are all these steps. And once that step is done, this now is plotting phase margin with the output voltage. Right. And you can see, yeah, you get really good phase margin when it's when the output is centered. But as you get close to rail to rail, you see you, you lose phase margin. You're down to less than 20 degrees. And, you yeah, know, you've yeah. certainly, if you've played with audio amplifiers, you've certainly seen audio amplifiers that have a nice sine wave. So they get the positive rail and they oscillate. They get away from the positive rail. They stop oscillating the positive rail. You know, you've seen amps do that. And this lets you uh, quantify it very, very well. In fact, if you, if you really zoom into um, the central region, you'll see that there's a lot of structure in exactly how the high side and low side varies. The phase margin varies wildly within, you know, within just tens of millivolts of, of, uh, of, of uh, output being centered. Um, I do want to touch on what Pete was talking about a second with power traction inversion, if I, if I'm allowed to, and that, this is a, um, a driver board, uh, that's fully modeled in QSpice. These are all hierarchical schematics. Um, this is actually in C. You give it, you say, uh, what frequency and what amplitude you want, and then it dithers out, uh, the control signals for all these gates, but everything is modeled. Every... Every power supply, um, you know, the whole thing is modeled. Every component of the board for this 300 horsepower um, uh, traction inverter, and you can watch the thing see, with the with the with the FETs, you know, with the wide band gap FETs, and you can watch this thing uh, drive the three phase motor controller, and then it's you know it's it's a chop controller, so the uh, um, the the chop frequency is also dithered between them all. So, uh, yeah, we could we could simulate the whole. You know, we, we, eventually I want to add um, motors so that we can simulate from the the battery chemistry to the rubber. That's the goal. Wow. That's what I'd be, be able exciting. to do. And is is this particular demo uh, project included in the current release? No, of this was or? a um, this was actually prepared for an in-house presentation at a local EV car manufacturer. Right. 
So I, this is what I'm not including in the demo. It, um, uh, there's a lot to explain and what it's doing, and yeah. I don't want to do that right now. Also, it's using parts that aren't not even announced yet for for the for the, the device. Right. It's using um, uh, a variation of um, of the CAS code, which um, is not um, is not publicly released at all yet. Right. Okay. That's exciting for the future. I think that um, you know that that's uh, something that people want to be able to do. Like you say, is is simulate all the way through the system uh, from from the beginning to the end. So uh, yeah, excellent stuff. So um, one last question to uh, Pete. Um, for those of us who want to start working with SICK for the first time and want to explore uh, SICK MOSFETs, uh, what does Corvo offer in terms of um, evaluation platforms or um, are, are there any sort of good books or other uh, online resources that people can access? Yeah, I think there's a host of material if you go to corvo.com. You'll find our product selectors. You'll find a, uh, a wide range of design resources, uh, short videos, how to best get performance out of these. We have on uh, online a, a, a free instant sort of device or, or loss calculator called FetJet, um, where you can sort of pull the, the device options from a drop down menu. And it's pre populated with all of the sort of relevant power topologies. Um, you can kind of calculate what losses you would have to do and then see what components uh, would fit your system. And then you can kind of go back into our product selector and, and find the right one. So, uh, yeah, a lot of resource on uh, Corvo.com, um, new Corvo Power Solutions page. And finally, to Mike, the same thing. How do um, people get to grips with QSPY who are using it for the first time? Are there, um, are there any books available yet or any books being written? We In Germany, at least, we... We love a paper book. So, the advice I tell people with uh, starting with QSpice is that it's supposed to hurt. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but um, you uh, uh, okay? So let, let's just. I, I think you go to uh, uh, www.qspice.com. That is live. Uh, you can press a button. And there's a number of videos there. Yes, at the bottom are various videos. There's a quick start guide that shows how to just drive the GUI. You know, it talks about, um, uh, you know, the right click menus, everything being edited in place and so on. And then there's how to import third party models. You just drag and drop it into the schematic. It makes a symbol and you go from there. And then there's a, um, a model, which basically it's, it's a six minute video. I don't know why I spent six minutes because basically I did the same thing I showed you of showing you how to write uh, C++ <laughs> and Verilog. So um, those videos are there. Um, we will be adding videos, but uh, yeah, qspice.com <clears throat> will be a link that will get you to the right part of the Corvo. There's actually, it, it directs you to corvo.com slash design dash hub, design dash tools, interactive slash QSpice. But if you just type in QSpice.com, you get to the right Corvo.com webpage. Super. I, I want to avoid my fingers getting blooded with all the typing. So I think we'll stick to the short version on that one. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's just a vanity URL to get to Corvo.com in the right place. Super. Well, um, as, as you can tell, we've, we're actually running over time today, and um, that's because both of these topics are exceptionally uh, interesting. And it's, it's great to see a, a brand new SPICE tool. I really appreciate, Mike, you taking us through it and, and showing us that, and Pete as well for your insights around um, SICK MOSFETs and, uh, and sort of the difference between the, the architecture that you've chosen uh, for your designs at Corvo uh, really helps to understand uh, the, the benefits and the advantages and it'd be really interesting to see in the future um, how you know how those applications that you listed um, come come to fruition. So thank you both very much uh, for your time today and joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Super. Thank you. Well, that's unfortunately all we have time for in this episode. So what did we learn? Simulation tools allow us to explore circuits before we can make them, and when it comes to semiconductor development, before a chip is even made. Of course, like any tool, you have to know how to use it and when you can rely on its results. And with wide band gap devices ramping up in both uh, the sales and importance in the applications that we've talked about today, having the right tools to design next generation high efficiency power converters will be key for electric vehicles, vehicle chargers, solar inverters, and other green power initiatives. 
Personally, I think it's great to see a new tool, especially a free to use tool in the form of QSpice and uh, with such a renowned developer behind it as well. I look forward to seeing how it develops in the years to come. My thanks go out today to our experts, Mike Engelhart and Pete Lucy from Corvo. You've delivered us some outstanding engineering insights. So that wraps it up for today. If you'd like more of the same, we're broadcasting two episodes of Engineering Insights every month in 2023. And to keep you abreast of other industry trends this year, take a look at News Bites, our monthly 15 minute show. Please like, subscribe to Elector TV Industry on YouTube and share our videos on whatever platforms you use. Additionally, you can now drop by the website at electormagazine.com slash EEI to see the topics for future shows and sign up for regular updates and reminders. Finally, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a tweet, or reach out to me, Stuart Cording, on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining, stay in touch, and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions.